Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Power Factor, brought to you by the fourpersons.net. My special guest today is Cherry Maestro Mallorca from the Philippines. How are you doing today? Hi, good evening. From the Philippines, this is Miss Cherry Maestro Mallorca, also known as Acronym Lady. Thank you, John, for having me here. Thank you for inviting me in your website, The Four Person um, Net. And for today, I am that I am um, given a chance to share with you also about uh, this very important gospel for today. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the four senses of Scripture, and then we're going to use that to go into as Terry mentioned, the gospel for today, which is a, a very important gospel reading. So let me bring this up. Let me, uh, I'm gonna share the screen here and bring this presentation up. Can you see the presentation? So we're gonna talk about the four senses of, of scripture. All right. Um, uh, let, me, uh, let me minimize this. Make this a little bit smaller so it's out of the way here. Okay, so we're talking about the four senses of scripture and how they relate in context. And then we're going to go into the gospel reading for today, which is, of course, a very, very important one. Okay, so the first sense of scripture is the literal sense. And this is where we, we examine what literary context is being used here? For instance, is this a is this a historical book, or is this a uh, are you reading a passage of the of the law or a narration of a historical event? Is it a parable or a story? Is it a prophecy? And a lot of these things have multiple layers to to them. They could you could have one book that has multiple different kinds of uh, these things in it, like, for instance, the Gospels. Then we have to look at what the actual words mean. Sometimes we have to go back to the original Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek because something could potentially be lost in translation. And then what do we need to understand about the analogies, uh, expressions used? Uh, sometimes some of the expressions are, are unique to the time and place. And we gotta have to look at the cultural context. How is the cultural different? How did uh, uh, historical changes affect our interpretation uh, of this passage? The second sense of scripture is the allegorical sense. And this is literally defined as something having a hidden meaning. Aesop's fables is an example of this. These are, these are little stories that are not to be taken necessarily at face value. They're little stories, they're little uh, fables that, that, that give a, a higher moral message. Parables, analogies, hyperboles are all examples of things that are, that need to be examined in the allegorical sense. And a big part of this is typology and prophecy. Uh, Allegory is very, very rich and deep in typology and allegory. And typology is connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament. So these are things in the Old Testament that allude to the New Testament and tie the two together. Whereas prophecy is looking forward. So there's a lot of symbolism, for instance, in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, a lot of symbolism and allegory. Um, and in the allegorical sense, we have to look at what is the moral or the lesson being taught. A lot of these parables and stories teach a specific moral lesson. So can passages be both literal and allegorical? Yeah, they can. This is uh, typology is a big example of this because we have things in the Old Testament like the last plague of Egypt, the plague of the firstborn, the Passover. These were all literal historical events but they pointed forward to the coming reality of Jesus. So they were literal and typological at the same time. 
The third sense of scripture is the tropological sense. And this is a fancy 64 cent word of saying specifically what is the moral lesson? What is the moral lesson being taught here in this passage? And how does it affect me? How does it point to me? And I know Cherry's ready to talk about that. Um, how does it show a particular commandment or virtue that we're supposed to uphold? How does it show a particular vice that we're supposed to, a vice or trap that we're supposed to avoid? And the last sense is the anagogical sense, which is another fancy word, means the prophetic sense. How does this passage point to the future, to something that will be fulfilled in the future? Is it in the future of the writer, but not necessarily in my future? Is it a prophecy for the future of the world? Is it a prophecy beyond, beyond earthly life into eternity and are there multiple layers of fulfillment? So how do we make sense of these senses? Can a passage, single passage be interpreted several different ways? Yes, it can. There can be layers of interpretation. A passage can be literal and allegorical and prophetic. So the question that you have to ask is, does the Protestant sola scriptura approach work? I think demonstration shows over and over again that it does not. It does not work because there's so many different layers and so many different things tied in together that we need the history component. We need the cultural component. We need the context and we need the, the, the Holy Spirit in the church for that. So we're going to apply it to today. And, and um, so I, what I'm going to do is I broke today's gospel reading down into several pages. Uh, Cherry, I want to go through them a, a, a page at a time and kind of get your thoughts as we go forward. Is that okay? So we start with the first one. It says, tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So I think it's very, very important that this first sentence here provides the context this is this is the quandary that jesus is answering by the parable that he's about to 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 tell here and i've got some companion scriptures going to be showing in 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 the in the future the pharisees and the scribes were very very sure of their own righteousness and that was the stumbling block. That was what actually prevented them, ironically enough, from coming into the kingdom. Uh, so uh, I want to get your comments on that before we go into the parable itself. All right. Okay. So uh, this gospel, according to Luke, actually is one of my favorite gospel, but uh, this also denotes lack of uh, cultural and contextual meaning from the from the Jewish uh, culture and also uh, relating to their situation by the by the author itself. And uh, so we have to take note of the following exegesis that are integrated in this gospel reading. For instance, the Pharisees and the scribes, they are actually the ones in charge. They are knowledgeable of the law. They are the teachers of the law. And they are also okay. so when they saw Jesus welcoming these um, people, these publicans, and they were they began to complain because they they are not actually um they cannot accept that Jesus, a teacher, would ac accept these sinners because of their self-righteousness. So they began to complain. And that is why Jesus uh, told them this parable of the two sons. Okay? Right. The younger sons, which actually symbolize the represents the sinner, the the one who who asked the father about the inheritance of him 
And uh, this actually, the, allow me to share with you this screen, if I can share the screen mm -hmm. as my... Are you able to share it? Can I share also my screen? Let me, uh, let me make sure that I'm allowing for multiple screen sharing. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm try and bring it up now. Let me see now. This one. It's not coming up. Can you see now my screen? I would rather uh, make a title that's just the prodigal son, but can also be a prodigal father. So when we talk about prodigal in the parable, is the uh, in the prodigal son who is the good son and who is the bad son, we are already aware of that in, at the end of this, the parable. But if we're going to change it, it can also be the prodigal father because it's the father's lavish love for the son that he did not um he gave everything to his to his son all his properties in the culture of the jew you are only allowed to take the inheritance when your parents are already dead but during this time in uh this is not acceptable to the culture of the jew to get or ask for the inheritance when the, the father is still alive. But in this parable, God, uh, the father gave up everything and gave what this uh, younger son had requested from him. So, so it's interesting. What you said is absolutely true. And, it, and it, it's very interesting that it shows a twofold interpretation of this passage. Because there's the there's the um, typological sense that you're referring to, but then there's also the uh, uh, the moral sense, a tropological sense too. Because it says man had two sons, mm -hmm. so the, the the two sons here is to be understood in two different ways. First of all, it's speaking in the larger general context of the obedient son and the disobedient son. OK, but it but it's also speaking in a more a specific context because Jesus is answering the Jews. This is one of the those passages where Jesus starts to allude to the fact that the Jews had betrayed their covenant. And the. The covenant was being taken away, there was going to, going to be a new covenant, and Jesus said that that your, your reign will be taken from you and given to a people who will bear its fruit. So really here, the two sons here are the, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews who, who were the first son, but rejected Messiah, and the Gentiles who squandered their life away on sin, but then later repented and turned back. So let's go forward. When the son had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. I think this line is very important here. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here I am dying of hunger. So he realizes, and, and, and this hunger could be thought of as a spiritual hunger, could be thought of as that, as that emptiness in his life. And here he is in a situation where he realizes that it is the fact that he betrayed and turned away from the father that is the cause of where he's at. So this is a person that is recognizing his sin and repenting of it. 
And in the next slide, we see the father's reaction, which I think is very important because I want you to comment on this because this is just what you were just talking about, the father's reaction. So I shall go up to my father and shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. So here's a, this son is in repentance. He's reviling his own sin. He's in, in repentance. The father's reaction, while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. So co comment on this before we go further. Okay, I, I just want to comment on this. Uh, coming to his senses or he came to himself actually is an expression which means repentance. But at this point, this is not a perfect motive of the son because he just realized that it is not more on um, his own will, but he has no choice, but he has to go back to his father. So for me, this is not yet a perfect repentance coming to his senses. It's just an initial act of the repentance because he did not realize when he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. He did not know well of his father that his father is a loving father. Because if he knew that, then he would not actually bow down and he would not say that. I treat me as one of your servant. See, mm -hmm. at this point, there are also some... Um, some uh, ways that this younger son did not really come to realize how much his father loves him, that he can forgive him no matter what he, have done, he has done to his father. But then a decision that is followed with an action when he was still far off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. So it is really the father's love, not so much on the younger son, but it's the father's love that, that the father must have been waiting for him, looking for him. And that is why when he was, uh, was still far away, the father already come approach him and embrace him. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? That's wonderful how God really loves us. No matter how sinful we are, God will always love us and will always accept us as long as we are willing to repent with all sincerity you know you're yeah. you're absolutely right it's 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 a, it's a process first is the attrition which is the regret for the consequences of our sin then there is the contrition which is true sorrow for our sins now you can see that this son has gotten to step one and he's gotten to step two he's truly sorry for his sins but then step three he hasn't gotten to step three yet which you brought up and and you very good. Step three is to recognize and trust in the mercy of the Father. So he hasn't gotten to that point yet. I, I'm, I no longer deserve to be called your son. So he, at this point, he's still in fear of going back to the Father to ask for his forgiveness. And let's look at the Father's reaction. But his father orders, ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now, before we go any, any well, but before we go any further, this is what happens. And, and Jesus talked about this, about the one sheep that left the 99. And there's more rejoicing in heaven for one sinner who repents than for the 99 that had no need of repentance. So this son is expecting to be, you know, his father is going to make him one of his servants. He's going to make him work in the barn or something like that. And just the opposite happens. The father is 
celebrates. The father is rejoicing at the return of this son. Now, the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, he heard the house. The, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fatted, uh, slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, we're about to get into some territory where, where people really like to resist and push back on this and say, well, you know, this story doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound fair. Because let, now let's look at the older son's reaction. I want to read the older son's reaction, and then I want to get your comment. The older son became angry, and when he refused, and he refused to enter the house. I want to, I want to really, really repeat that first sentence again. The older son became angry, and listen to this: he refused to enter the house. Now here, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. They're refusing to enter the house, the house of God. They're refusing to enter the covenant of faith because, and I have some other companion scriptures I'm going to show that bear this out, because the son is enraged that they're rejoicing that the other son has come back. His father came out and pleaded with him. And he said to his father, look, all these years I served you, not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a young ghost, uh, goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughtered the fatted, ca fatted calf. Okay, before we get into the father's response, this is what people need to notice. This is what's going on here. Notice the difference between the two sons. The two sons looks at himself and says, I've squandered my inheritance. I'm no, not worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against you and against heaven. The other son, on the other hand, says, all these years I served you. Not once did I disobey your orders. Listen to this sentence again. Not once did I disobey your orders. Is that a true statement? Of course not. Of course not. So the older son is trying to justify himself by comparison to the younger son. And the, other, the younger son is not trying to justify himself, but he's repenting of his sin and relying on the mercy of God. So the older son is relying on his own righteousness to get him to heaven. The younger son is relying on the mercy of God to get him to heaven. That's the difference here. So this is what the father says. My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. But let's go back to the, let's go back to the top. He refused to enter the house. So the father is saying, my house is yours. The son refuses to enter the house. And we hear people talk about how can a, a loving God condemn us to hell? This is it right here, folks. It's us who refuse to enter the house. The Father's opening the door to us. It's we that refuse to enter. And it's his justice that ratifies that, situa that, that situation. Because he says, for now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost. And, and, and has been found. Think about this. What kind of brother wouldn't rejoice that his brother has been brought back to life? What kind of brother wouldn't rejoice that his brother has been saved from damnation? And yet this older brother who represents the Jews is so wrapped up in his own righteousness, his own sanctimony, he can't even be happy for his younger brother who has found his way back. I'd like to hear your comments. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, that's, that's right. Um, there are really two kinds of brother, but I would like to go back first in this part 
when the son, the younger son, were, was actually explaining to his father, but the father interrupted him and he said, no need to, uh, because the father who loves anyone who loves us need not an explanation. So the father stopped the, the younger son to explain. And then he said to his uh, uh, servants, quickly bring him the robe, the ring, and the shoes on his feet. These are actually... Uh, gives us some meaning, like their best robe assures of the son respect. So he restored the respect for this younger son who was dead. And the best robe actually, not just a respect, he even gave him the, the ring. This ring is also a restoration of the father's trust in the son as he gave back the authority. So when the younger son uh, came back sincerely to the father. He restored the dignity. He restored the authority. And the shoes that he gave uh, to him signifies that now he is no longer a servant. He is no longer poor, but rather he is a free man. So when the father told the servant, get the fatted cup and kill it. Let's eat and celebrate. Again, this is a telling us that there is a joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. So because of this, the father, the killing of the fatted cup and the merriment were to make the return of the cause of joy, of not only for the father, but for the whole community as well, mm -hmm. right? So, but then that the coming of the elder brother, whom you said a while ago, Refusing to participate in that merriment, in that celebration by quarreling him in front of the public just showed that the elder son is resentful. And so the elder brother disowned his brother. He disowned his brother when he said, this son of yours, the elder brother disowned his own brother. Good, good and, point. Good point. Yeah, the father, I, I, I never picked up on that. Then the father said, my son, your brother. So the father again returned to the elder son and said, your brother, he is referring to his being a brother. The father now reiterates to the elder brother that indeed you are brothers. See, so the father here is really trying to make up and to, to make this reconciliation between the brothers, the younger and the the elder brother. That, is, into that is an amazing, amazing insight, Terry. That is an amazing insight uh, that I've never recognized there because what you're what what you're saying is that this passage is actually showing that salvation is for the Jews and the Gentiles. Both brothers are invited. They're both they're they're both invited. It is the older brother that chooses to exclude himself because of envy towards the younger brother, even to the point of disowning him, this, this son of yours. Uh, that, that's a brilliant insight. I'm, I'm really, um, wow, I'm, I'm amazed by that. That's, that's, so let me e exit from this. And I've got a couple of companion passages that, uh, that I want to bring up that I think really uh, illustrate this. And the first is from the gospel, also from the gospel of Luke, but it's later in the gospel of Luke. So, so for some people who might be saying that we're, uh, we're making too much uh, of, of this, the Jew versus the Gentile separation, listen to this. This is from the 18th chapter of, of Luke. He then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Terry, this is just what we're talking about right here. The older brother was convinced of his own righteousness and despised even his own brother. Okay? He then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went into the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now, think about who he's addressing in this, in, in this parable. The Pharisee would be very, very convinced that he was the more holy of the two. If you ask Jesus, like a Pharisee and a tax collector went into the temple, who was the most holy? The Pharisee wouldn't 
hesitate to say, well, of course, the Pharisee is the more holy. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. Spoke this prayer to himself. Okay? This is a very, very important distinction. Spoke this prayer to himself. Oh, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity. Greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like, listen to this, even like this tax collector over here. I, can you imagine the temerity, the gall here? This, this Pharisee is saying, thank you, Lord, for not making me like this scummy tax collector over here. And then he proceeds to trumpet all of his wonderful accomplishment. I fast mm -hmm. twice a week. I pay tithes on my whole income. But listen to what the tax collector did. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can just see the image, can't you? I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the story of the prodigal son. The older son exalted himself. The father exalted the younger son because he humbled himself. And before we, I want to go to one more passage just to really hammer this home. This is from Matthew's gospel. Again, we're talking about the image of two sons. In case anybody thinks that, 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 that this point isn't being hammered home over and over again, Jesus again talks about this in the standard of two sons. What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, yes, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the father's will? They answered, the first, Jesus said, uh, the first, Jesus said to them, amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven before you. Now, Terry, I want you, <laughs> I want you to try to imagine the rage that they would that that they would have displayed these holy and righteous men in their in their expensive vestments parading themselves out like proud peacocks to all of the people telling all the people how holy they are, and Jesus is telling them prostitutes are going to enter the kingdom of heaven before you will. When John came to the way of righteousness, you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your mind and believe him. So it's, it's their intransigence. It's their impenitence. It's their refusal, if you will, to enter in the house when the father has the door open. Because I can't enter in the house. You let that lowly tax collector in. You let that lowly prostitute in. And these people are, are, they're, are, they're not understanding. You're not going to get into heaven by your own righteousness. Neither the Pharisee nor the reprobate is going to get into heaven by his own righteousness. The difference is the reprobate recognized it while the Pharisee did not. So, um, again, your comments. Right. Okay. First of all, uh, the parable can help us understand that the stages in our journey back to God is not a shortcut. There is no short way. We have the journey, and first of all, we need to be um, we need to have this uh, admission of our sinfulness. We have to admit that we are sinners, and we have to humble ourselves. Because there is no um, true or genuine repentance if we are not showing humility with the Lord. So we have to accept first our sinfulness and we have to sincerely go back. And th that, um, the story of the Pharisee, the parable of the Pharisee and the publicans who 
praying in the temple at the same time, that the prayer of the Pharisee was not pleasing to God because of his self-righteousness. Well, the other, uh, the publicans who prayed, he admit all his sins and he cannot even look up and uh, look straight to the Lord because he knew that he was a sinful man. So that is how God wants us because yes, the, the door is open for us, but God is not forcing us to go inside. It must be from our own um, willingly and uh, we are actually given of choice by God to accept it and work for it, exert all our efforts. And of course, we have to reject evil. So there must be the process first is self uh, admission of our sinfulness, humility, and sincere and exerting effort to go back to God. From then, we can actually uh, do this journey, the process of journeying, go back, going back to the Lord. And this is um, very timely indeed that we are now in halfway of the Lenten season. We are now in the Retire Sunday. We have to be rejoicing. And the gospel reading is very timely indeed that the, the prodigal son is, this parable is telling us that, wow, we have this merciful and compassionate God. We have to be happy. We have to rejoice and be glad, right? Now, the other thing, um, so I went to mass last night. I went to uh, Saturday evening mass, um, really because I went with my mother and that's the mass that she prefers to go to. Um, and our pastor gave a very interesting take on this parable that I had never heard before. Uh, and I think it, 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 it has some bearing out that, that um, he talked about it in terms of extremes. And I think we can extrapolate it to, to our church today. How does this parable relate to our church today? Well, it has to do with the extremes. It has to do with one son who went to one extreme and another son who went to the other extreme. And the one son who went to the extreme of debauchery, throwing his life away, squandering his, his, his money and his uh, inheritance. And, and we have other examples of this. The Old, the old uh, uh, Testament example that we have, this is Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, we have Judas, who, who, who betrayed the savior for 30 pieces of silver. So this, this selling out of our inheritance for, you know, for a pittance is, is the one example of the one son. But then there's the other son who's so convinced that he's holier than everyone else that he has now blocked himself from uh, access to heaven because of his, he's so convinced of his own righteousness. And Jesus actually called these people children of hell. That's what he called them. He said, you're a child of hell. You are not achieving the kingdom, but you block the way for others who are trying to. You'll tra traverse the world to make one prosel uh, proselyte. And when you do, uh, you, you'll, you, you traverse the world to make one convert, and when you do, you make him twice the child of hell of yourself. Cherry, I want I, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to draw a parallel to today's modern Catholic Church, and this was kind of going off the foundation of what the pastor said. There is, there are those who are sincerely trying to live the Catholic life, according to the catechism, according to the authority of the Pope, according to the teachers' teachings that we have, uh, the sacraments, the devotionals, and, and all of those things. Now, not saying those people are not struggling, not saying those people are not sinners like everyone else, and they, ha and they have to pick themselves up, but they're going down the middle. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing without being to one extreme or the other extreme. On the one extreme, you have the, I hate to say it, the, the Joe Biden Catholics. They're Catholics in name only. They're pro-abortion, they're pro-gay marriage, they're pro all these 
things that are anathema to the church, uh, and 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 they call themselves Catholics. Uh, uh, I, I've heard them referred to as the Pace Catholics, and Pace stands for Palm Sunday, Ash Wednesday, Christmas, and Easter, because that's the only time you see them in church. The Pace Catholics. So they're just going through the motions. They're they're not true Catholics in any sense. But then, so so that would be the son who squandered his inheritance. Then on the other extreme, you have the super righteous Catholics who consider themselves who holier than the Pope, who call the Pope a heretic. Uh, you know that that. Only the Latin Mass is valid, and I'm not saying anything against the Latin Mass. But anyone that says a Novus Ordo is not a is not a valid Mass uh, is in the wrong. And I found that these Catholics are the most likely to fall into her in, into the heresy of the false private revelations, the divine mercy revelations, the 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 apocalyptic visions like Garabandal and Bayside and Medjugorje, these, these you know, off the chart apocalyptic, you know, visionaries. Like for instance, there's, there's one vision in Medjugorje where uh, a woman who, who supposedly turned out to be the Blessed Mother dressed in black was about to drop a handkerchief into the, into the ocean or something, I'm paraphrasing, something along those lines and so they asked for the handkerchief and they said, had you not taken the handkerchief from her, it was going to be the end of the world. These are crazy, crazy, crazy prophecies. And, and, and so those would be the modern day Pharisees of the day. And where, where the other side would be the modern day Sadducees of the day or the modern day reprobate. Reason I'm making this, drawing this, this parallel is I want to pose a question to you. Do the same rules apply that applied back then that would indicate that it's easier for God to reach the sinner, easier for God to reach the reprobate than it is for him to really reach the, the holier than thou person? And I'd like to hear your comments on that. All right. Okay. Thank you for that opportunity. So for me, actually, um, Sin took us um, away from our father because of our self-centeredness, our personal gratification, and none of this relationship were, can establish lasting relationship, right? Self-gratification and our self-centeredness. Both of these young and elder brothers have their own self-gratification and also their self-centeredness. But now, it's really hard. There are some questions that really we cannot answer, but I believe that Jesus is the answer and his mercy, his love and compassion is overflowing. But then religiosity is not enough. Yes, we have this very structural uh, religious setting. We have the sacraments. We have all this provided by the church. But there is something missing nowadays that I think because of this, some people leave the Catholic Church. There must be a deeper relationship, self personal relationship with the Lord. And that can only be done through deeper spiritual nourishment or what we call the spirituality in the church. That is what we need right now. We have to balance this religiosity, righteousness, and spirituality of the church. Because if we will only rely on this more on first communal prayer, it's not enough. We have to go deeper. We have to really uh, go beyond these five senses. We, we cannot really understand God. It, we only use our intellectual knowledge of him but we can really fully understand the amazing love of God, his overflowing mercy and compassion if we will go deeper and we'll have this what called spirituality in the church. And hopefully what, we can what do What it sounds that. like you're saying to me is that 
seeking God and knowing, uh, seeking to know God on an intellectual level alone is not enough. Yes. That you must seek him with your, as the gospel says, with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and your whole strength. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's correct. That's perfect. Yeah. Where, where have I heard that? That's what this is about. People ask me, what is the four persons about? That's what this is about. That's the message here is those are the four persons, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and your whole strength. And you, you hit the nail right on the head because that's what it's about because it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of complete surrender. It's an issue of complete surrender uh, because so many people want to hold part of that back, that, that, they, that they, they want the emotional attachment to Jesus. They, they want the, 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 the feeling of love, the emotional attachment, but they don't want the intellectual attachment. Well, I'm and, and these are the Catholics that say, I'm a Catholic, but I'm a Catholic, but I don't agree with the church on this. Well, now you're not surrendering your intellect because your intellect is only valuable in the context of you believe what it is that you have to believe. Your mind is ordered. Your mind is subject to, to your soul. It's subject to divine revelation. It's subject to the teachings of the church. And it has to do with all of the things that you're doing. Um, are you working on uh, when, when, when you should be going to church? Are you not honoring the Sabbath day? Well, now you're, you, you know, you're using your physical self. You're going out to try to, 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 to um, live outside of God's uh, covenant in that respect. And, it, and there, there, there are so many things. I want to think for myself. I want to be ruled by my own thoughts. I want to be ruled by my own feelings. I want to be ruled by my own, you know, what, what, whatever physical uh, chains that we live under. It is, it, it's, all, uh, it's all summed up in the fact that to serve and love God, it must be whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, whole strength. You can't hold anything back. And the only way that that's accomplished is by humility and obedience, humility and obedience. And I think that when you talk about the sun on the left and the sun on the right, it's really two sides of the same coin. It's a lack of humility and a lack of obedience. I want to do my own will. I can decide for myself what is right. I can decide for myself what I'm going to believe. I can decide for myself what I'm going uh, to, to do. So when you fill up your soul with your own desires and your own will, there's no room for God. So to go into that deeper relationship that you're talking about in the previous ministry that I came from, we call it deeper truth. The one that I had to leave was precisely that path going deeper. But in order to go deeper, you have to be led by the spirit. It has to be, it ha, it, 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 it's, it's, he leads and you follow. And sometimes you don't know the direction. Sometimes you don't, sometimes he gives you for today, just what you need for today in terms of light, in terms of inspiration. Uh, is, is, is that right? Yeah. When you go a bit deeper, we have to lower down our nets. You have to give up something. You cannot go deeper without giving up something to the Lord. That's like when, when Jesus uh, told Peter, go deeper and lower down your nets. So what are these nets that we cannot lower down? These are all pride. These are all the, the things that hold us from going deeper to the, to the reality of our, of our being created from the image and likeness of God. Because nowadays, the people are more uh, so um, conscious about the physical appearance, about the, what uh, this is temporal, but forgetting more on the spiritual or something that is uh, eternal. 
So this is also something that we have to um, meditate upon it. As we have to do this balance of awareness of our body and soul. Right. And part of that, and part of that awareness, part of that humility and that awareness is the is the knowledge that you and I can't do it by ourselves. We can't, we're not able to. We're not able to. And and that's where we need to understand uh, that we need grace. We need the sacraments. Uh, and, and folks, you have to put in the time. You have to put in the time. You have to pray. If you're not praying uh, devotionals every day, devotionals like the rosary every day, you're going to be lost. If you're not going to, you know, an extra mass occasionally, you're going to be lost. If you're not going to adoration, you're going to be lost. You're not going to have the strength that you need to fight. And when you think you can resist the temptations that you're going to face in life and overcome the obstacles that you're going to face in life under your own strength, you're setting yourself up, up for failure. So it's more, it's more of that withdrawing more and more and more. Uh, and Jesus said it, he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who exalts himself will be humbled. Uh, and the Pharisee was so sure of his own righteousness that he actually cut himself off from the possibility of salvation. It's not something that we can do uh, by ourselves. And I think St. Augustine put it best. St. Augustine said, without him, I can't. Without me, he won't. I think that sums it up. Okay, so I think we really have to do more about this. I am glad. I thank you for having me. I learned a lot, and I hope to to discuss more on this for person that it's yeah. really some something that I am looking forward for. You had some you had some great insights, and I thought this was a really good uh, a good start. And it's kind of funny that this just happens to be the gospel for today because the return of the prodigal son if you're going to talk about the catholic faith you're going to talk about faith in general this is a pretty logical starting point to kind of uh, uh to draw the parallel and now now we can go deeper in, into kind of what paul was talking about about separating the works of the law from from faith because this is it right here the Pharisees thought they were saved by the works of the law. They thought they were saved by their own righteousness, by the, by the sacrifice. Um, sacrifice of the Old Testament didn't save anybody. And the, the, the sacrifice of the New Testament, the one and only perfect sacrifice of Jesus, can't save us either unless we cooperate with it. We have to cooperate with that, with that grace. And you have any final thoughts before we wrap it up? And for final thoughts, I would actually uh, just hopefully we will be able to continue this because in this, this is not just the work of the bishop, the pope, and all the clergy. This is also the duty of all baptized Christians because remember, when we were baptized, we received this threefold mission of a prophet to evangelize, to proclaim the word of God, of a priest to pray for one another, and of a king to serve one another. So this way, we can do our duty as a prophet by this ministry. And by being a priest, by praying for one another. So probably we can end this with a prayer. And this can also be served as a service for us because Jesus said true worship must be accompanied with service. All, All right. right. So why don't you close with the prayer then? All right. Okay. So let us all be aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we praise and thank you for this wonderful insight. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for all the grace and inspiration that you have given to us. Hopefully, you are able to enlighten the minds of our viewers, of our listeners, but we are only your instrument, O oh Lord. 
because we believe that your word is alive. It gives us life and it changes our lives. Please give us more grace that we will be able to show this in our own little way that the people will see your light in us so that in our sinfulness, we can also show that you are indeed God of mercy and compassion and you are always ready to accept our our reconciliation with you and with one another. We would like also to ask this opportunity to pray for our church, for our Pope, the Bishop, and all those who are called to serve you through the people that given to them. And also for our state, for our country, please give them, Lord, enlightenment that they may do their service, not just being a politician, but to serve as a servant of love and we would like also to ask for our grace for our family please keep them always safe oh lord and for all the sick the suffering and the dying and for all the souls in purgatory this we ask through the mighty name of your son jesus christ who lives and reigns with you with the holy spirit and through the intercession of the blessed virgin mary saint joseph and all the saints amen in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. I can't wait till our next episode. God bless. Thank you. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.